Hey YouTube, this is Darnell Craig here with another weekly video. Um, I'm excited to get into the video that we have this um, week. But before I get started, I want you guys to make sure that you go enroll in my free webinar, How to Study the Bible. This webinar will be this month on April 27th. It will be on Zoom. Um, in order to register, you have to go on Eventbrite, or you can go to my um, Facebook page, Darnell Craig, and it, the link is um, pinned on my profile. But it's a webinar for those who love the Word of God, love to study, love to learn, love to grow. If you just read the Word and want to understand it on a deeper level, this is the webinar for you. Um, it will be life-changing, so make sure you enroll in my webinar, um, How to Study the Bible. It will be so great for you. Um, also, um, don't forget, um, the last Thursday of this month will be NABA. So NABA is when we go live once a month and we prophesy. So me and Nate will be on NABA the last Thursday. So make sure you mark that in your calendar and spread the word. If there are people you know that need to hear from God or want to, if you want to receive the word of the Lord, that's going to be the place for that. So keep that in mind as well. Um, last but not least, I just thank you so much for the birthday love. My birthday was Saturday. I turned 33, and I'm so grateful for all the love you guys show, all the support you guys show. Thank you for those who gave, and I'm just so grateful for everything, and I'm excited about this new year of life. And with no further ado, let's go ahead and get into the video. Um, today, we're going to talk about the mystery of destiny, the mystery of destiny. And I do want to say this as well. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you like the video. Likes help the videos out so much. And make sure you comment on the video. It helps out so much. It help me spread the word. If a video blesses you, share it with four or five people that you know will be blessed by it as well. But today we want to talk about the mystery of destiny. It's going to be so important um, because this is something that you really need to understand in order to walk out God's plan and God's purpose um, for your life. Um, but we're going to define the word destiny when we talk about destiny. I want to define this word destiny. When we talk about destiny, the word destiny, um, we're going to break down this word. It means an overruling necessity. It means the irresistible tendency of certain events to come about. And it means a, a force that shapes and controls lives and events. It also means that which is predetermined and sure to come true. And it means that which is firmly established. It means what is going to happen to a person in the future. When we talk about destiny, we're talking about the tendency, the irresistible tendency of certain events to come about. And it means an invisible force that shapes and controls lives and events. And it means that which is predetermined and sure to come true. Now, destiny is so important because the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, it says that there is a season for everything and there's a time for every purpose under heaven. So our God is a God of purpose, which means there's nothing that God does that is unintentional. There's nothing that God does that is without meaning. And because our God is a God, a God of purpose, with every purpose that God has, there is a set or specific time on earth for that to be executed. Um, also, God is a God of seasons, which means that a season is a, a portion of time where things work a certain way or things are uh, constructed a certain way or things are um, things are designed to come true a certain way. So our God is a God of purpose and our God is a God of of seasons. Right. But seasons and times are earthly things. There is a season and time in heaven, but in heaven, um, God is not bound by the time you know. God is bound. God functions on eternity time, eternity past, eternity present, and eternity future. And eternity is an entirely different realm where there is no time. Like time has no basis in eternity. I'm using time as a human construct to help our minds understand how the invisible realm works. But time is something that has to do with creation. Before time, there was not, um, before creation, there was no time. There was only eternity, which is very interesting. So we're going to define certain things and get into a certain precepts that will help you. So let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. It says, The Lord smelled the soothing aroma 
And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account for man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I've done. Verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. But one of the things you want to focus on here is it says, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest. So you have to understand that God is a God of processes. And everything that God does is in seed form. God never does things in their full potential. He did it one time with Adam. But ever since Adam, everything else is seed. And how this works is God gives us things in seed form. And God desires us to cultivate things into its full potential. So whatever God has given you, if God has given you a child, if God has given you a business, if God, if God has given you an organization, if God has given you a ministry, if God has given you a destiny, whatever God has given you, it's in seed form. And as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed, it's going to take time, and then there will be a harvest. And one of the things that God has, uh, one of the things that God calls seed is you. So what God does is God sows you into the material world as a seed. And you want to take some time and then God will harvest the seed he's planted. This is the process of destiny. How destiny works is God sends you into the material world, the physical plane, and in relationship with God, the seed of you is cultivated and comes to fruit or full potential. And then once you reach your potential, God harvests you and God benefits from the seed he's planted. So we talk about the mystery of destiny or the process of destiny. God has to take you through a process of cultivation. So the seed that he's planted in the earth to be a blessing to all those around it will be harvested. But if we don't go through the process that God has ordained us to go through, then the seed that God has planted will remain alone. It's never God's will that the seed remains alone. It's God's will that a seed is sown, a seed is cultivated, and a seed is harvested. And once again, that seed is you. So how God works as God is God does everything in seed form. God never gives you anything mature. God gives you everything in its, in its potential. And what God wants to do is walk you through the process of actualizing the potential of whatever God has given you. If God has given you a marriage, you've been married a year, that's so beautiful. Your marriage is limitless potential. But in the process of time of you both walking with God, God will cultivate you both and God will harvest the potentiality of you as a, as, as a unit, you and your union, so that he can harvest what he's planted. I'm going to write about it. This is how God works, by the way. So as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed, there's going to be time, and there's going to be harvest. I want to, I want to go build a framework. I want to go to John chapter 9. I want to lay a, lay a foundation for you guys of how God works. John chapter 9. Is it John, by the way? I may actually... Um, went to the wrong. Let me, let me see. Give me one second. So I may have done this wrong. I want to go to. I went to the wrong verse, you guys. Let me see what verse this is. I want to go to John chapter 12. Not John chapter 9. John chapter 12. And we're going to go somewhere. John chapter 12. And we're going to go to verse 20. It says, Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These people then came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and were making requests of him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
Philip came and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. But Jesus answered them by saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I want you to be aware of this because once again, the way God works is God works in times and God works in seasons. And one thing you see about Jesus is that Jesus was very aware of times and seasons. You will hear Jesus say statements such as, it's not my time yet. The hour has not yet come. The hour is now. Because Jesus was very aware of what was on God's calendar. And if you walk with God, you can be very aware of what's on God's calendar. You can be aware of when um, it's not your season. You can be aware of when it's not your time. You can be aware of what hour it is. You can be aware of what hour it isn't. But when you walk with God, he gives you the ability to discern times and seasons. And one of the ways you can tell a time and a season is by observing what's going on. Read the scriptures. Jesus said, hey, you can tell us about the rain because of the cloud, or you can tell us about it be this because of the sky. He said, how hypocrites, how can you not discern the times and the seasons? You have to pay attention to what's happening in your life. You have to pay attention to your circumstances. You have to pay attention to your surroundings. You have to pay attention to coincidences or, or accidents or whatever, because that gives you an indicator of your time and your season. I like these quotes. They say there's no such thing as a, they said that there's no such thing as an accident because God set it up. And they say that a coincidence is just God's way of staying anonymous. Now watch this. So Jesus said, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall in the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So think about it right now. If I were to get an apple seed or a grain of wheat, let's use an apple seed. When you plant an apple seed in the ground, that external casing is not the seed that that houses the seed. But in order for the what's in the seed to manifest or be expressed or to come to fruition, fruition, the outer casing has to die. And when the outer casing die, the real seed emerges and there's a law that's happening underground that we don't know. Because if we observe this law underground, we kill the seed. The Bible actually says that um, the kingdom of God is like a man that planted seed in the ground and he rose up day and night. And he didn't know how, but then he began to see the fruit or the progress of what's happening underground, which is a mystery in itself. But what's important for you is that you are a seed. And unless you're willing to die to self, unless you're willing to die to selfish ambition, as you're willing to die to the ways of the world, as you're willing to die to the things that God wants you to die to, you're going to remain alone, right? Because as long as the earth remains, it's going to be seed, time, and harvest. When I say remain alone, it does not mean you don't have family. It does not mean you don't have conversation. It does not mean you're isolated. But it means that you're unable to harness or actualize the full potential that God sent you into the world. Because in order for you to um, actualize your potential, you have to go through the process that Jesus went through. Jesus went through birth. Jesus went through um, death. Jesus went through burial. Jesus went through resurrection. No, Jesus went. So you had to go through those four processes as well. You're going to be born out of heaven. Write right about it. You're going to die to self. And your death to self is going to feel like you're in a season of hiddenness where you're underground. Nobody knows you. You're buried. You're forgotten about. But in the midst of that burial process, you're resurrected back to life. And now everyone sees the newness of life that's upon you. If you want to understand how this process works, you can go research the caterpillar to the butterfly, how the caterpillar goes through a process, goes through the cocoon. And what's very interesting about the process of a caterpillar in a cocoon is that when a caterpillar is in a cocoon, if you try to help the caterpillar get out of the cocoon, you kill it, which means that sometimes you're in a process with God, which is you and him. No one can help you. And when I say no one can help you, it does not mean people cannot encourage you or comfort you, but you yourself have to walk out the process that God has ordained for your growth, your development, your cultivation, your transformation. But if someone comes in and sabotages it or tries to have mercy on you or be like, you know, this is too hard and you shouldn't be going through all this, they don't know what destiny has ordered for you. But God is taking you through a process of cultivation so you can become the individual that God has ordained you to be before the foundation of the world. But then once you come through that process, what happens? You transform from the caterpillar to the butterfly. But 
unless you fall in the ground and die. One of the things it speaks to in the mystery of destiny is that there is an atmosphere or there is an environment conducive for your growth. Birds have air, fish have the water or the sea, and you have the presence of God. When you look up the word Eden in the scriptures, it literally means his presence. In other words, it's a place of delight. Human, uh, humankind was created to engage in the presence of God. What the, sun, what the sun is to a flower is what the presence of God is to you. And if you're going to grow, you have to cultivate a relationship with God. You have to be consistent and intentional in building a relationship with God so that in the canopy of God's presence, you can grow into the person that God has ordained you to become. The Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. So when you talk about waiting upon the Lord, that word wait is not about time. It's about posture. That word wait gives you the connotation of a, a waiter or gives you the connotation of an individual that is surrendered and that is submitted to God. And when you surrender to God, when you submit to God, when you engage God, there's a transfer that happens in the process of relationship. Well, what God is doing in the relationship is God is exchanging your weaknesses for his strengths. God is exchanging your inability for his ability. There's a great exchange that's happened that you know not of, but when you come out of that exchange, you can feel the effects of that exchange when you traffic or you engage in everyday life. But in this process of destiny, you have to be in the right environment. You have to be in the environment of his presence. You have to be in the environment of healthy relationships. You have to be in the environment of community. And when you're in these environments, you grow and you thrive and you become the person that God has ordained you to be. This is very, very important because because if you're not in the environment that God ordains you to be in, if you don't go through the death that you ordained to die, then what's going to happen is you're never going to reach your full potential and you will be a would have been, could have been, uh, should have been instead of a, a person that God has promoted, that God has glorified and that God is using for his glory and for his praise. But we have to be willing to surrender to the process God has preordained because the mystery of destiny says this, that before you were born, God tailor made a process and God tailor made an environment for you to actualize your potential. And a lot of times we hate the things we go through. We hate the process we go through because we don't understand that our destiny has arranged these things. I'm not talking about foolish decisions you've made. If you made foolish decisions, they will work together for your good. If you repent and realign yourself with God, we're not talking about that. We're talking about it seeming like life is unfair. We're talking about it seeming like life is so adverse to you. We're talking about it seeming like you have a steeper hill to climb than other people. We're talking about it seeming like that nothing ever goes right for you. We're not talking about operating under a curse. We're talking about God building character, God building intestinal fortitude, God choosing to reveal himself to you and show you things about himself you could have never learned before this. I'm going to write about it. It says, but truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat fall on the ground and dies, it remains alone. It says, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Verse 25, it says, the one who loves his life loses it. So what happens is we receive Christ and we try to preserve ourselves. You want to stay exactly the way you are. Here's the issue with that. God loves you 100% the way you are. But God also has a plan to change you. And when God changes you, it does not mean that God loves you more, but it means that you can experience more of the love of God. So God loves you 100% the way you are, but God has a plan to transform you. But what happens to us is we resist God's plan to change us. We resist God's plan to transform us, and we refuse to let go of our way of thinking our way of functioning. We refuse to let go of our way of perce perceiving, but God wants to transform us. The Bible said this way. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the sure mercies of God, you what? Present your body to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is a reasonable service. In other words, the rent you owe to God is to give him your body for his glory and for his praise. The least you can do is give God your body because Jesus gave his body for you. So God wants you to use your body for holy purposes and God wants you to use your body to accomplish his plan and his purpose in the earth. This is what God wants you to use your body for. But he says this, 
He says, in addition to allow me to use your physical vessel, he says, do not be conformed to this age. That word world is, is the word age. In other words, in every generation, Satan forces an ideology, a worldview, and a, a way of functioning upon an entire generation. And Christians are the people that are countercultural. Christians are not, um, they're not the people that dress the weirdest. They're not the people that um, fear monger, um, fear mong. They're not the people that are, are religious zealots, but they're the people that function out of heaven. They're the people that live from God's mind. They're the people that represent God's heart. They're the people that God will use as catalysts to bring change and innovation and um, breakthrough and revival and uh, reconciliation on the face of the earth. So in order to properly function as that vessel, my mind has to be not conformed to this age because you can't change anything you like. You can't change anything you are part of. So in order for you to change something, you have to come out from that system, come out from that um, programming, come out from the matrix, Neo, and then you're the one that God has chosen in order to, un I mean, to unleash other people from that matrix. But many of us, we're still in the matrix of the, this age. And the spirit of God wants to untether you from the matrix and use you as the one that God has chosen to set others free and to give others hope and to reveal that God is alive, that God is not dead, and that God can, can transform a person from the inside out. So it says, do not be conformed to this age or this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, allow the, allow the spirit of God to pull down your strongholds, the lies you believe about yourself, God, others, and life. It says, and to cast down um, on vain imaginations, imaginations you have that lead to discouragement, depression, vanity, nothing. Um, and and let, let the Holy Spirit take away those imaginations and then what every hot thing, everything that you believe that you've exalted above Jesus and this is equal to Jesus in your ideology and in your mindset. Let them do that. This is the renovation the Spirit of God comes to do. And when you allow the Spirit of God to renovate you from the inside out, you become a vessel that God houses and he lives through. God lives through you already. But the, the willingness, your willingness to yield is the degree that God will get glory through your life. We say it this way. God can never do a greater work through you than you allow him to do in you. So God does the work in us first and then he does the work through us. A lot of us want God to do a great work through us, but we won't let God do a great work in us. The, the, the work through you will be equal to the work in you. Very important. Now watch this. It says if you if you preserve your life, you're preserving the old. You hold on to the old. Things have to stay this way. Things have always been this way. I've always believed this way. My grandma, my granddad, my mom, my dad, they believe this way. It has nothing to do with your destiny, purpose, and your call. Because they could be an error. They could be wrong, although you love them. But God wants to untether you from what? The ideals, the convictions, the worldview of this generation. And he wants you to see yourself, life, and others through the eyes of heaven. But if you're willing, if you love your life a lot, you will never be the person that God ordains you to be. When I say love your life, we're talking about self-preservation. We're talking about resisting the hand of God. We're talking about not allowing God to convert and transform your soul. Right. And it says, but the one who hates his life, the one who is willing to lose his life, the one who is willing to change, the one who is willing to transform. The one who is willing to become, the one who chooses to be a living sacrifice, that's the one that's going to transform. That's the one that God's going to use for his glory and for his praise. That's the one that the spirit of God will, you, will find as a resting place. Am I right about it? But this is what, the thing that destiny orders for you. When we talk about destiny, we're talking about what God predetermined about you. We're talking about what God has ordained since before the foundation of the world. We're talking about the place that God desires to take you. I want to show you another thing. Let's go to the book of Romans chapter 8. We're going to walk this thing out. Romans chapter 8. It's very powerful. Romans chapter 8. Verse 26. It says, now in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. 
And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is why it's so important to pray in tongues. Because whenever you pray in tongues, you're basically saying, God, I don't know what's going on. God, I don't know what's happening. But God, I know you do. So I'm going to yield my tongue to you and I'm going to let you pray through me. Anytime you pray in tongues, you're always praying the perfect will of God. Anytime you're praying in tongues, you're setting yourself up to walk out God's will, God's plan, and God's purpose. And a lot of times, God will inspire you to pray in tongues for long periods of time because God is using your tongue to birth out your destiny and your purpose. The more you pray in tongues, the more your life will align with God's will, God's plan, and God's purpose. And the more you pray in tongues, you'll be used as a womb to birth your destiny and sometimes the destiny of those connected to you. Verse 28, it says, and we know that all things, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So when God has called you according to his purpose, when God has called you according to his will, then what it literally says is God is in all things. And what is in all things doing? He's in everything, working it together for your good. So God is in everything that's happening. Nothing you're going through is void of God. Nothing you're going through, God is not in but God will manifest himself in what's happening and cause it to work together for your good. That's the God we serve. Verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he will be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now watch this. So there's something called the foreknowledge of God and the Bible calls it the predetermined counsel of God. This means that before God made creation, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they sat in a council and they predetermined how the course of history would go. They predetermined the major things that would happen and they predetermined their redemptive plan. So God in his foreknowledge sees the end at the beginning and God has made provision for every mistake. God has made provision for every injustice. God has made provision for all sin. And the first thing that God did was before he made the world, a lamb was slain. God made a sacrifice that would ensure that his purpose, his plan, his will will be done. And God has made a sacrifice that will ensure that any mistake, any failure, any shortcoming can be redeemed and be bounced back from. And God put a resilient spirit in his people so they can overcome and bounce back even when they fail and sell themselves short. So what God has done according to his purpose and destiny is God knows everything and he planned things according to what he knew what he knew about creation what he knew about humanity and what he knew about you specifically so God knew you before you existed and what God has predetermined is that you're going to go through a process where you become like Jesus and your generation. Yes, you may be a female, but also there's a feminine aspect of Jesus you're going to embody. And God's going to use you uh, through taking you through a process so that when people see you, they see Jesus. God has a process he's already ordained that you're going to go through. And once you surrender and you cooperate and you respond appropriately, when this processing is over, you want to look like Jesus in a female vessel. You want to look like Jesus in a, in a feminine vessel. You're going to look like Jesus in a masculine vessel if you're a male. But God has an ordained, but based on what he knew about you, based on your potential, based on your personality, based on your gifting, based on your talents, based on your level of notoriety, based upon your bloodline, God already has a plan to take you to a place. And this plan is that you will be conformed to the image of Jesus. When I look at this example, what I think about is I think about a stencil. And I think about everything, every person that God made, God had a plan that this person would go through a series of life events, a series of circumstances and situations that they respond to it right. If they develop roots in God, if they engage God, if they develop a relationship with God, then the sufferings that they go through, the trials, tribulations they go through, the experiences they go through, the circumstances they go through, will cause them to come out on the other side like Jesus. They'll be a life-giving spirit. They'll be a, a person that others can feast on and through feasting upon them. They'll give life to those around them and they'll be a person who would suffer for other people because God will use them as a deliverer, as a redeemer, as a restorer of the streets to dwell in and a repairer of the breach. This is what God wants to use you to do. But what happens to us is we feel sorry for ourselves. We fight destiny. We fight purpose. And what happens is we miss out on what God truly desires to do. Now watch this. So God foreknew us, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So Jesus would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Verse 30, it says, and these he predestined, he also called. So think about this. 
Bef God knew you before you existed in the material world. And what, based on what God knew about you, he predetermined some things about you. And because God predetermined things about you, he's called you, which means that God has summoned you for his kingdom, for his service and for his glory and for his work. So there is a call of God upon your life. And the mystery of destiny is that you're already called based on what God knows about you. He needs you for his service. He needs you for his purpose. He needs you for his kingdom. He needs you for his purposes and plans in the earth. But not only did God summon you, he also, he, he it said those he called, he justified, which means that he's, he's forgiven all your past sins, all your past mistakes, all your past failures. So he did not call you to hold you guilty. He did not call you to leave you in condemnation, but he called you to give you a fresh start. And at this moment, if you believe God can cleanse you of your sins, he can declare you forgiven and God can release you from the weight and the bondage of sin, guilt, shame and condemnation. And what God would do is he will deal with you just as if you never sinned. So when God calls you and you accept that call, God is going to deal with you according to your purpose and your destiny, but not according to your sins. The Bible says in Psalm 103, he does not deal with us according to our iniquities. We bought into an ideology that God deals with us according to our sins. Yes, you sinned today. Yes, you sinned last week. Yes, you messed up. But when God is dealing with you, he's not dealing with you according to your sin. God is dealing with you according to the person he sees you as because God sees you as the finished product. God sees you as the person you were before the foundation of the world. And God is dealing with you in the present based on the person he's called you to be in the future. So everything God is doing in your life right now is based on the person he already sees you as. And the process of time, if you respond the right way, you want to become the person that God has already ordained in the, in the future. But God isn't dealing with you according to your sins. God is not dealing with you according to your shortcomings. God is not dealing with you according to your mistakes. But God is dealing with you according to his plan, his purpose, his will, and his destiny for your life. So God deals with us just as if we had never sinned but watch this it says in these he justified he also glorified saints if you go through the process if you surrender to the hand the plan the purpose of god there's going to be a moment when you develop in character a moment when you develop in wisdom a moment when you develop in understanding a moment when you develop in knowledge that god's going to glorify you we were taught you know don't touch god's glory um, and but I want to share something with you that God shares his glory with his children, which means that when you become mature, when you bear the name of God, when you bear the nature of God, what God's going to do is God's going to promote you and God's going to show you off to the world. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. This is submitting to God's dealing. This is submitting to God's laws. This is submitting to God's ways. This is submitting to God's process. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And what will he do? He will exalt you or promote you and do season. Saints, because of your destiny, there is a season of promotion. Because of your destiny, there is a season of exaltation. Because of your destiny, there is a season of glorification. But we must be willing to go through the processes that God's going to take us through. So in his time, in his way, he will promote us and he will pour his spirit out upon us and people will see what it's like for God to rest upon a man or a woman and use them for his glory and his praise. People will see what it's like for God to favor a person. People will see what it's like for God to enlarge a person. People will see what it's like for God to restore a person. People will see what it's like for God to heal a person, deliver a person, redeem a person, all because you went through the necessary processes that destiny wanted to take you through so God can use you for his glory and for his praise. Saints, listen, I want to encourage you today that destiny is on your side. I want to encourage you today that God will deal with you just as if you've never sinned. I want to encourage you today. There is provision for your sin. There's provision for your mistakes. There's provision for your shortcomings. There is provision. God will forgive you if you acknowledge your sins. 
and God will put you back on the course of destiny because the Bible says the path of the redeemed or the just, the righteous, it shines brighter and brighter into that perfect day. The path that God has you on, saints, is going to get brighter and brighter. No matter what's happening in the world, if you're just, if you've been justified, which you have because you receive Christ, what your path is getting brighter and brighter. The plan that God has for your life is to give you a future, a hope, and an expected end. Thoughts of good and not evil. God is not going to leave you as an orphan. He won't leave you nor forsake you. He won't abandon you because you messed up. God is committed to causing all things to work together for your good. God has a plan to give you a house you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant. God has a plan that his blessing will overtake you and the blessing of the Lord to make a rich and add no sorrow. Come on, somebody. God has a plan. And I would encourage you that if you submit to the process of destiny, your life will never be the same. Saints, if today blessed you, if it encouraged you, make sure you like this video. I want you guys to comment how it blessed you, how it helped you. And I really pray your life is never the same because of this video. I really felt so stirred to talk about this. And I really pray, I really pray that it ministers to you in the place that God has ordained. Saints, I'll talk to you again soon. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.